the developer is the least we can say, the best we can say is he's got a dodgy background that needs a lot of examination. He has failed. I think this is a personal view. Yes, everything is personal. <laughs> he's, he's had, fa he had failed um, attempts to do this. And one thing particularly that he's done is he's done the first thing which these schemes require, that is to build the background housing to get the funding in. And then he's in the South Wales scheme, he's dropped, and they've got the houses now, um, but the scheme has been, has been dropped out. A lot of people, the company went bankrupt, that particular company, not this one, because they regrouped the very group of all the in the company. So the, the, in fact, the, the, the proposed development is exceedingly dodgy. And we talk about Jack Nicholas. He's got nothing to do with it. Jerry, can we, can we have, have a bit of time for some more okay, questions? Okay, okay. So you know, oh, just finally, all we know that there are exceedingly great problems of flooding in this area, and that's not, that's going to be difficult to overcome. And the consultant's report doesn't make that clear. I'll be very, very amazed and very disappointed. Okay. And the other final thing is, we don't want. I'm opposed to the scheme. I will continue to be opposed. I think, I think, I think people, have, I think people, have, people have gathered that one, Jerry. So, yeah, they might have done. Just to, uh, I think, just to uh, to restate what you said, Jerry, in terms of your comments around the developer, who I have no idea of and never met, they were your personal comments. So I don't think we as a committee or certainly as a council would be associating ourselves with them because frankly I just don't know and I wouldn't want to make comments about individuals and their business practices without having uh, some knowledge or evidence around that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you know, you know, well, okay. Yeah, as, well, a, as elected councillor, <coughs> we're entitled to state our views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody okay. knows. Okay, Jerry, opposite, Jerry, and Jerry. Opposition minority party, Jerry. Opposite, got no part of the council. Clearly what Jerry. you said was not a council view. Okay, good. Matthew, <laughs> very briefly. Because uh, I just... A, bit, a little bit, like a minute, Chair, uh, not good. ten seconds. Um, so there's a few things raised. I mean, I would I would really caution. I mean, I, I found that meeting that I had invaluable because it raised additional. You know, we've got people in the, in the borough who are not officers of this council who are experts on matters and who have done enormous amounts of research on this. And I was grateful to the people in that meeting for bringing some of those things to my attention. Um, and I, I, the principle underlying all of this in terms of the decision making has always been transparency. And frankly, I am not in a position as a cabinet member to ever wanting to approve something that I think will be damaging to our economy, ecology, and environment. Not, not, not something on my radar. So, what I would like to caution. Um, pardon, sorry. Well, I think, I think, okay. I think, I think, I think sorry, Chair, going, sorry, Chair. Chair. I think, I think we need the facts before we can, we can make judgment in terms of the end thing. What I would caution everybody, not just our councillors, but I heard things in what was just said before that I believe to be factually untrue. And I, I know there is a, there is a prospect here because it's <coughs> understandably controversial and a number of people are unhappy about it. But I want to see the facts coming through. And I'm slightly unhappy when I hear things being suggested that we either don't know or are directly not true. So I think we need to be careful as councillors, especially, especially as councillors, I think I think talking about a one point eight so through you chair, talking about a one point eight million pound cost spiraling through the council already, I understand is not is not the case. Um, and finally, in response to the invitation to the meeting, um, I was asked by uh, residents in my ward about this. It's not part of my cabinet portfolio, and I suspect I, like all sixty six councillors on the world, that want to represent my residents and ask officers for meetings are fully entitled to do that. So I would recommend to councillor and it's that he does exactly the same as I did. Okay, well, what, what we have been quite good at in this committee, I think, is try to be as uh, as reasonable and um, rational as possible, but also, so it does become really dull, I think it's, it's good that people are able to speak their minds, and uh, the only thing I would just say is there is always, everything we do, because we are a 
Committee of the Council does have a framework in terms of what we say about who and how we say it and, and the weight of gravitas is given to that. I personally, if I just think if you're going to have a, a meeting with community groups from around the area about some of that, I think it might have been a good idea to, to invite somebody, a representative of the ward councillors. I, and I know, because I actually know that Jerry and the Hoylake ward councillors have, um, through the community groups, had a series of major meetings around, around this too. So I don't think it needs everyone. People will have different views, but they need to have them based on the facts, and I think that's the, that's the key. I'm also entitled to have private meetings with my residents and officers that they, so that they so wish to have. If the message coming from Jerry is any future meetings about this, he wants to be involved, I'm happy to make that the case. And the final thing I didn't address at the actual point from the rest of rather than having an argument with councillors, about due diligence, I know David touched upon it before, but I, again, I was struck when I was shown, I'm not sure which member of the of the meeting showed this, but just the spider web of companies, and I don't think it was any derogatory sense, but just a huge number of companies involved in this. And so clearly that's why months of due diligence is required for this. And I will be learning, I, hopefully we will all be rather learning the lessons of what's happened in Liverpool to make sure that everything is utterly watertight if we are ever minded based on evidence to go forward with that. And, and I would say that we need to be completely um, uh, in, in full, bait, full knowledge of all the facts following due diligence, whether we were to approve or deny yes. the request. Correct. So you shouldn't deny it on the loan of assumptions, are you? you know, so you need all the people need all the information to make the best possible decision, decision on, the, on the basis of what's in the best interest for we're all and local residents. So, Again, we've done lots of talking, so thank you for sparking that debate on. So, the next one is... Karen? Yes. Kieran, is it Karen? Karen yeah. All right. Yeah. Karen, Karen O'Rourke. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Karen. Uh, golf is off again. Right. Um, in 2015, a significant number of properties in Mells and Morton flooded, having a devastating effect on local families. Investigations found that the flooding was caused when surface water drains could not discharge into the River Burkett and Arrow Brook because the river system was already full. This was described as a 1 in 86 year storm event, i.e. a statistical chance of occurring once in 86 years, based on historic records. The large, the large concrete areas of the Holy Lake Golf Resort, housing the state and new bypass will dramatically increase surface water runoff, which will increase flood flows in the River Burkett system. Planning policy will only require the developer to protect for flood risk up to a 1 in 100 year storm, based on historic statistics. However, with climate change, we are seeing more and more frequent extreme weather events. If and when the Wirral experience a flood event greater than 1 in 100 year flood, the Gulf Resort will increase flood risk in the Burkitt Valley. Do the councillors agree that it is just too risky to build such a massive development on the River Burkett floodplain? And do you agree that any council tax income from the golf resort could be swallowed up by having to deal with the clean-up of properties flooding more often? Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, our environment spectrum, do you mind? Or should I ask David to answer it? Well, I mean, this isn't... This isn't particularly about flooding. You could bribe up the river like that. That is the reason why it happens. Uh, this is more about the golf course. I think Matt. Okay. Okay. okay, David. Oh, come on, oh. Go on, David. No, no, no. no. I'm, he's okay to pass it to another councillor as well. That's not everybody. No, I'm, I'm asking. No, no, there was a reaction. I just don't expect. Go on, David. I think, I think in terms of the answer, James took this to the. Um, the senior officer who's responsible for this in the council, gentleman called Neil Thomas. Neil Thomas works with the Environment Agency. I think his answer came back to us in two parts, really. First of all, in relation to the flooding, the September 15 flooding records show that four properties in Mells experienced flooding, three external and one internal. <coughs> flooding in Mells was caused by operational problems with drainage assets, not by high levels of water in the River Birkin. In Morton, the flooding around the Millhouse Lane area was caused by high levels in the Arabrook preventing discharge of service water drainage systems with a particular issue around the road bridge of Bermuda Road. The water levels within the River Berkey were not a factor in any property flooding. And then he goes on to talk about the new, any, any new development, the generalised comments about any new development and how they have to 
and they have to not increase the flood risk within the site or anywhere else, and they have to have sustainable drainage systems to limit natural drainage. And all the risks, all the flood risks are considered as part of any planning application. Okay. Okay. Do you want to have a quick response? Quick response. Um, I used to work with the Thomas, and I'm very well. Um, I read, I got those details and statistics from the council's own report in 2014. So to say that it has nothing to do with the River Berkis is, is completely incorrect because it's in a report from the consultants and it was basically that the River Berkis levels were too high. And then with regards to saying, oh, you've got to look at the planning will look at flood risk. Planning will only look at flood risk up to one in 100 year storm. And if they can prove that they won't increase flooding after a, up to a one in 100 year flood storm, then planning policy is to say, yes, it's okay. As we all know with climate change, you get greater than one in 100 years storm, the flood defences won't be up to it. And I'll just mention that in August 20, 2011, we had a one in 461 year storm, and that again is from our council's own report. Matthew, just, um, just again, because I know Kerry was there, and um, I'm unfortunate that Kerry's here and, and taking active interest in this because of, of um, Kerry's own expertise in, in um, storms and flood defences. Um, just I think it would be pertinent for the audience to know that, uh, from recollection, David Ball, the senior officer, said that some of this, um, some of the answers we we're expecting are going to come as part of this report that we are that we are still awaiting. But I was pleased that a part of that came an offer to say that when that does come, because I there, there was concern over perhaps officers being stretched. Um, that when that does come, he's happy to meet directly with Karen and share all of the information about that. So, uh, again, that principle of transparency, openness, and engaging people, I think, is there. Good. Okay. Uh, Chair, Chair, just very good. Yeah. It's, it's, it's suddenly become more about flooding, so I think it's well, I, think I thought that's what it was to begin with, to be honest. Also, it, climate change. So to so my mind, it was about the, um, the effect of the golf course being built and that increasing surface of flooding. That's what I thought. But now we're talking about the Arrow Brook. I'm aware of that problem. I have spoken to United Do Utilities. United Utilities about trying to sort something with it. No, you've misunderstood me. The two are if you build on a floodplain upstream on a river system, it will affect the flooding down. Yeah. Okay, down. okay, that's the same. So that's so not that's that's what I that's what I thought you said, and that's why I passed it on to my colleague who's yeah. dealing with, with the golf course. But now it's mentioned about the arrow brook, just a slight comment on that. Which feeds into the river Burke, which will be affected by the golf resort upstream. Yes, so let me speak about the flooding, which happens despite the fact there's a golf course or not, we already get flooding because of what happens there. So let me speak about that very briefly. We're trying to put some measures to relieve some of that flooding, but as you probably know, because I think you're an expert, you know far more than me, what it means really is a runoff work somewhere where that water can kind of stay whilst the Arab is usually flooding. I've spoken to United Utilities about doing this, but they, don't, they won't do it. They don't have the money to put in that type of uh, flooding solution. Again, you probably know more about reading about this than me. So we need to think of a different solution around that area. The solution isn't add more flood water into the river by building a massive dip Well, okay. I, I think, uh, thanks for answering, uh, because I think it was environment related to, uh, but uh, I'll just say this, actually, to be absolutely fair to Phil, I think as a, as a relatively new member of the executive of cabinet, I think Phil's doing a doing a great job, actually. I don't know he's not in the same party as me or whatever, but I think he's doing a really good job. So uh, it will be a bit unfair to have a stab at him. And, but, and I do think one of the key things, and I'm glad Matthew said it, and certainly from what you heard from Jerry and others, uh, they won't get away without it happening, is when this due diligence report comes out, it will have to cover um, elements of, and when the whole report comes out about the project, it will have to address these quite important and contentious issues because it simply wouldn't be credible if it wasn't. And I think, you know, having sort of done it myself on occasion, it's quite, it's quite hard on the executive actually because if they spend money on getting the expertise to, to do this, then it goes against the count of it's already cost us one point however many millions of so, so it is in a, a the, the, the executive are in a bit of a bind and a vice but on the other hand it is of their own making so that is that is how you go sorry i'm going to try and keep to the list well tim watson are you tim watson because oh, yeah. yeah. tim... you should have my name on the 
my name on your list. Yeah, I'm and just it's very fundamental. Sorry, I, I do apologise. Can well, we I just apologize. go through? I can we go through the list, please? Yes, please. Because I was going to call Tim Watson oh, next. Sorry, Kevin, next. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Well, Pig Phil's already uh, asked my question right. around that way. It's about uh, Lady Belfer once again. Um, it's a Linux joint venture group. And the question is: Is he a really a suitable developer for the council to do work with? And just to say a couple of facts, he, he has set up three businesses in the south, in south Wales. Uh, the hotel company didn't build the hotel. The company that was set up to build the houses went bankrupt, owing uh, 22 local companies £600,000. And obviously the company that ultimately sold the houses made a lot more money than he would have done if the other company had uh, gone into voluntary liquidation. So the question is, is this developer suitable partner for the council to be working on. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's a good question. John Davis, there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, Davis. I think it's the same answer as we gave before, which is we're not in a position to comment on these companies until we've done the due diligence on them. Anyway. Well, we've, we've avoided them on the first phase, yeah, but we've been waiting for the full submissions as to what they submit for this scheme. Check. Check. Hang on, hang on just a sec. Sorry. So, David, have you? Yeah, I'm, I, 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 I'm more cautious in giving my response because I'm a council officer and it could be interpreted as a council view. I can't, well, give, we'll watching I can't give personal TV. views. I can't give personal views like elected members can. These companies have made it through the first phase of submission. They now produce their detailed submissions, which is due to what we put down to due diligence. If we as council officers, and I'm not saying you're wrong or you're right, but that's what we have to do because people come to us all the time with comments and what they suggest is evidence about companies, but we have to do it through a proper process. Okay. And, and, and uh, you know, what I think is useful is that colleagues and members of the public are bringing this to the council's attention, actually. Yeah. Because at one time, it might well, those days before Google or whatever it was, uh, people might not have known about these particular issues. And I think the most important thing that happens is that uh, members of the public, colleagues, bring this to the table and bring it to people's attention. Because then once it's been brought to people's attention, it has to be addressed. Because if it isn't addressed, then we get into the due diligence issue and then we get into officers and members yeah. going to and, prison and issue. It, it isn't that it isn't useful, it's just being cautious. I'm sure because it's discussed here, I'm sure when the officers bring the relevant reports, the elected members who are sat here, I've no doubt, will ask particular questions based on this information tonight of officers, and officers will have to be able to give the responses. I, I would bet my pension that this will be called in for further scrutiny, and officers will be called in to, to, to have questions asked of them there. So it isn't that this is wrong or not useful, it is, but we are where we are in a process, and I just have to be more cautious than, than, than you can. So, so, thank you. We're not, it's not being ignored, but it's been, and I'm going to try and keep going. So, Neil Parry? Yeah. Uh, quick question, which I, which I thought was about the bypass road, but from what we heard earlier, it might be Heron Road and or the bypass road. It's really, um, you know, it's probably one of the biggest developments through Hoy Lake. Where is the bypass road running from and to? And who's going to be paying for it? Is it going to be the developer or the taxpayer? Does anybody know? Anybody can advise on this at the moment? Well, I'm going to push this to David first. Sorry, because David's the officer. But if anybody else wants to leave it and say whether it's going to be capital or, uh, or the developer, more than happy to have that contribution. I know of the scheme and I know where it runs from and to. I don't have the detail of the funding. Okay. Okay. That's Go on, Matthew, you've been uh, leading the charge. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, um, with, I'm not sure which parts of the meeting you had with David, some of that may have been confidential, so without, without overstepping certain boundaries, but I'm pretty sure David referred to a potential fund with no guarantee about that. And, and so sure just said the single investment fund here. But there's a potential fund that we can tap into for the road if, and it's a big if, as I keep stressing, ever the scheme was given the go ahead, subject to all of the concerns that are laid out by people here, people not in this room, and, and us as councillors as well. So you say that the scheme goes ahead, 
and the county was going to fund the road. That was no. the question. And I, and I, I just said, I'm sure not, necess well, not necessarily, necessarily was the answer. But, but, yes. Just clarity, the single investment fund is the sum of money that the, the government's devolved to the city region. So, so that's an uncontrolled the, the Metro Mayor. And that the purpose of that fund is, is to improve economic growth. So we put an application in as a single investment fund to, to fund the, the housing improvements. But the, the answer there is, like my old friend Dave Jackson used to say, well, if it comes from the government, it's still taxpayers' money. Yes. Um, so, yes. so, so, you know, so is it coming out of the national tax pot or the, the local tax pot? And I think the, the suggestion there was the that single investment fund. If you separate out the golf, if you just set aside the, if you just set aside the golf course issue, and we're just talking about a road. Three ways of paying for it. The council could pay for it from its capital program. You've already heard that there are people here who feel that they they would be further up the queue for having their road done first. Yes. Secondly, it's regional funding like that which officers have to bid for and then there's a process not just for roads but for other structures as well and investment into all sorts of other things where we prepare bids and they go into the city region and they're prioritised against other bids in the city region. That's the second method. And the third method would be if there was some form of development, whether it, whatever it be, where a private developer would contribute to the cost of the road. Those are the only three funding streams. Sometimes it's not one, it's a combination of one or more. Okay. Did you say you knew where the road was going to run from? Yeah, it runs from the High Lake Level Crossing through to the Solwell Massey Road. Well, you need a bridge. Where? It's not a bypass. It's right. an escape from Hoy Lake. It's, by, it's not bypass yeah. Hoy Lake. No. It's getting people, it takes people away from Hoy Lake. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the ideas of the scheme yeah. was to bring people into Hoy Lake to promote whatever it was promoting in Hoyland. Why do we need another golf course in Wirral? There are, there are, in every single golf course except the Royal Liverpool, they're desperate for people yeah. to join. Yeah. Why do we need another one? Because yeah. of the houses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. I like this. This is lots of audience participation. However, I did promise, and you were not sure that they said, I did promise, <laughs> promise you could ask the question. It's a very fundamental question, ladies and gentlemen. It's very fundamental. This business of building on a floodplain in Hoylake, we have 15 golf courses already on the road, two champion golf courses, eight private, and five municipal. In the name of all we hold sacred and dear, why did we want to build a speed article? We have, we have children relying on food banks to before they go to school. We have dire need of social housing and affordable homes. 